Hey everyone, and welcome to Chew Stream, where we talk about art and life as an artist. My name is Bobby Chu, and I also have on here artist Thierry Lafontaine. Thierry runs the Schoolism Lake House just outside of Montreal, Canada. It's a completely immersive 30 day in house workshop where artists that attend would be living and learning with their mentor, Thierry Lafontaine. Now, if you can't make it to the Schoolism Lake House 30 day workshop, maybe you don't have the time in your schedule or can't be away from home that long. I highly recommend getting a Schoolism subscription because that way you can have art courses and assignments that you can do at your own pace from the comfort of your own home. And right now is the best time because you can save a hundred dollars off an annual subscription. The one time payment gives you access to all the schoolism courses for an entire year. There's many different ways to learn. There is no right way to learn other than making sure that you're learning the right material from the right people. Schoolism instructors are artists that have been nominated for Oscars, won Emmys, art directed at Pixar, work for Disney, DreamWorks, you name it, design creatures for Star Wars, Planet of the Apes, children's book illustrators, as well as illustrators for Rolling Stone Magazine and Time Magazine. Forget Bitcoin. Your education is the best investment you can make. So get a Schoolism subscription and make 2018 the best year yet. Hey, T, how's it going? Hey, Bobby. I'm doing great. How are you? Good, good. It's been a while. It's been super chilly, so I uh, haven't been <laughs> going out too much, but... Uh, Hope you've been doing good. Uh, I want to start off, and of course, uh, those of you that don't know, Thierry LaFontaine, I call him T for short. I believe it's because when we first met, I was like, Thierry LaFontaine? Like, I, I was like, I couldn't get my head around it, so instead I just started calling you T. Or maybe you suggested it, I forget. But, um... <laughs> With a French name like that, it's uh, right away I tell everyone to call me T. Yeah, somebody was asking uh, the other day when I was doing a stream, what would be, you know, what what do I think about nicknames? What do I think about pseudo names uh, for, you know, posting online and your social media and stuff like that? And I was like, if your name is like John Smith, then probably change it up as well as if your name is very hard to pronounce. So uh, I'm sure you can relate to that. So to start off the stream, I want to go to a couple uh, questions that we had previously that we couldn't get to. Okay, so the first one is Jonathan. He asks, hey, Bobby, sorry if this has been asked and covered. Do you do any live seminars, demos throughout the year? outside of te of uh, course teaching in Toronto or otherwise. Actually, yes, we go all over the world. Um, right now, if you go to schoolism.com and you go to workshops, you'll see the eight cities that we're going to be going all around the world, um, as well as as the year goes on, you'll see a few uh, private workshops as well. I'm going to be going to Israel. That's going to be awesome. First time there. Uh, I believe that that's in June. And um, there's something else. I'm, I'm going to Ringling College next month in just about one month time. I'm going to be going to Ringling College and talking with the students there. So I love doing that kind of stuff. Um, and there you go. Okay, so next question is, what are some good newbie studies? Now, this is from I Like Cake. I like your handle, by the way. Um, I like cake as well. So I would love to ask T this question, you know, because you've taught so many people at the Schoolism House, the Schoolism Lake House and everything. What are some of like the best exercises, best studies that you give the more newbie uh, artists? That's a, that's a really great question, Bobby. My, one of my favorite uh, exercise uh, kind of type to do is 30-minute uh, studies. Why I do 30 minutes is because I think you get the most out of it in 30 minutes, and you can keep working on something forever. So uh, I feel when I go over 30 minutes 
the return I get from the time I put on it starts to uh, free fall. So I'd rather do two times a 30 minute study of the same thing than a one hour study of that one thing. And I feel if I would do four 30 minutes study of a thing. Well, this is, this is specifically, sorry, this is specifically for people that are very new to art. Is that very the same art? Yes. Uh, st 30 minute studies, but I would do, um, studies of geometrical forms. Okay. Usually simpler. White. I see. Yeah. So simpler simple things like subjects. a cube, a sphere. And, um, I think it's the most useful thing I ever did in my entire life. And also with the workshop I do, I give my students uh, that to do as homework and I paint over their cubes and their spheres. And I think I probably did over a thousand of these. Okay. <laughs> okay. But uh, one thing I want to address is, you know, because we all remember when we first struggled with painting and things like that. And I remember um, looking on the forums and back then it was Saijin forum and there was, oh. there was Spooge on there, which is Craig Mullins, the ultimate digital painter. And he gave this wonderful tutorial about painting white objects, cubes, uh, spheres, cones, and et cetera. And I was, you know, I was looking at this, I, I was gobbling up the info. I loved it. But at the same time, I was like, but I want to do that kind of concept art, that really epic stuff. And cubes, spheres, and cones are the least, they are the least related to epic stuff that I could even think of. You know, that's how I perceived it. But, you know, for those of you out there, why does T say and emphasize simple objects like that? It's because first, you have to learn how to paint these simple objects. Then you have to relate complex objects to simple objects, right? And that is, that is the connecting tissue between uh, painting very simple studies that are just like white objects to doing epic, amazing uh, illustrations. Wouldn't you say, T? Yeah, uh, absolutely. There is not a single thing that I paint any time where I'm not thinking about the cube and the sphere. And I don't know if you remember, Bobby, the first time we got Craig Mullins into a Schoolism Live, it was in uh, Toronto. He was an extra special guest. Yeah. And someone in the audience asked him, what's the most important thing you ever learned in your entire life uh, relating to art? And he said that it was painting those white objects. Yeah, which would totally shock a lot of people. But imagine you could look at a tank and you just see a cube. You know, then you could literally rotate the cube in your head and all of a sudden paint the tank from an upshot, you know, uh, 30 feet in the air, even though you're not actually 30 feet in the air looking down at a tank. You're doing it mm -hmm. all out of your head. Right. Being able to paint very complex things. The key to it is being able to observe it and think about it in a very simplified manner so that your message is simple. Everybody will understand it. And uh, when you're thinking a lot simply, you have more control over it. And like Kim Jong-gi was saying he, he thinks about cubes and boxes all the time. Right. In your interview. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen him draw these uh, just cubes in perspective and then all of a sudden put like a soldier on the ground and this crazy angle and everything. But it totally lines up to the cube, right? So painting exercise uh, to answer the question, uh, I'm not, it was about painting. Yeah, yeah, and, and you totally answered it. You know, it, you should paint simple subjects in the beginning, right? And look for the nuances, the subtleties and the tones and the texture and everything. You know, is a box completely, is it going to be completely smooth and shiny and just perfect? It's probably going to have some sort of texture somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. 
so even if you feel like you can paint a box really well, mm, I would I would question that. For most people, for most people, there's still many things to learn. So why don't we go to another question here? Um, somebody was actually asking, I'll just answer this simple one. Who's the one painting? I'm the one painting this one. This is, uh, well, this was at first, it starts off, I don't know what I was thinking of. You know, it doesn't really make sense because there's snow on the ground and there's tropical leaves in the background, but I take care of that later on. This was very just unplanned and just painting for fun, which ended up be, becoming a uh, popsicle unicorn. So stay tuned and you'll see the popsicle unicorn appear. Now, uh, let's go on to the next question here. And I'll take another question from the previous week. Axel said, in the book, uh, the perfect bait. You spoke about needing to become motivated in order to become, to be able to work hard and love it. I was wondering if you could explain on how to get motivated. Now, it seems like, and this is wonderful, it seems like uh, these questions, it almost has a theme to it. Fundamentals, uh, starting off, perhaps starting off as a professional. So, this is really great because when you become a professional, you don't have assignments anymore. You don't have deadlines anymore. A lot of times you're making up your own projects, your own assignments, so to speak. So how do you stay motivated? Now, I have a lot to say about this, but I'll give it over to T first. How do you stay motivated when you're the most motivated? How does that happen? <laughs> It's when I draw and paint stuff that I'm excited about. And, um, you know, sometimes I like to do uh, quick stuff because uh, you get kind of an instant reward. And um, my trick to stay motivated is that I work on a bunch of different things at the same time. Mm. So if I feel I get a little exci less excited about something, then I, I'm going to work a little bit on a sculpture. And if I... I'm a little tired of that. I just go on a watercolor. I do some gouache studies. I paint on the computer. I sketch. So um, drawing and painting stuff that you love is kind of uh, exciting. That's a real great way to warm up, I find. But, you know, what if you're on a project that you don't necessarily love or you got stuff to do today that you don't necessarily love? How do you stay motivated? Uh, that's a really good question. Like for me, I meditate. So why does that help? I'll tell you. You know, when I'm meditating, um, I do a guided meditation by... Dr. Joe Dispenza, he wrote this book that I really loved uh, over the summer. I was reading this book called You're the Placebo, which is very good. Anyways, so this guided meditation, during the guided meditation, he asks you to focus on kind of like a couple things that you would like to change or you'd like to be or whatever. And I would picture, I would imagine that I'm super motivated. And actually, he asks you to, I'll tell you a funny story if that's okay. You know, um, he tells you to concentrate on two things that you want to change. Okay, so one for me is being motivated, just energized. And not just motivated, but um, you try to put it in a way where it's a lot more emotionally impactful. You know, so instead of just being motivated, I think about... Being very, you know, motivated to the point where I am changing people's lives in a positive way because, as you know, T, that's been my kind of mission statement forever. Um, so I think about that. You know, when I think about not just being motivated, but, oh, people are really being affected in a positive way. They're getting a better life. You know, they're getting a better career by me sharing or whatever. It makes a big smile on my face. It puts a big smile on it. And when you think about the times where you are emotionally affected hugely by something, 
it can change your life. A lot of times it does change your life. Like maybe you got scared, got chased by a dog when you're little and now forever and ever you're afraid of dogs. You know, so I attach something really strong emotionally to that. And for you, maybe it could be uh, the viewers, you know, perhaps it's you already achieving your goal. You have already achieved your goal. You are already a rock star. You're doing the big things that you want to do. And you focus on that and you live in that moment. You don't just concentrate on it like, oh, I want this to happen. I want this to happen. No, you go, this has happened. What is my life like? And you keep picturing it, right? And why does this work? I'll tell you with the other example. The other thing I think about is because a lot of people know I've been dealing with arm problems for like, you know, a few years. It's gotten getting better and better. Um, but one of the things I do is I think about not just I have a good arm now, and this gets a little embarrassing, but instead what I think is I have an amazing sexy body. That's just like, you know, you walk down the street, everybody's looking, just going, wow, that guy has an amazing body. Now, it's not like that is my goal, but I'm trying to attach a big emotion to the fact that I have a strong, healthy body. You know, I just want my arm to work well. But when I picture that I have a ravishing body, and it's amazing, will I want to go to the gym after? Yes. I would, because I'm thinking all I need to do is maintain this. You know what I mean? So if you think to yourself, I have amazing art skills. I have amazing art skills. I am really good at art. Now all you need to do is maintain those practices that got you there. Because you are no longer the student. You are no longer the entry-level professional. You are the high-level professional that is in demand and what kinds of practices does that person do that person does a lot super long really answer cool. and that's from is it can you name again uh what uh, person or book that was from uh so it's by this guy named dr joe dispenza he has a bunch of guided meditation recordings that you can buy off of his site. I am not affiliated to this person. I just, I'm a, I'm a fan. I'm a user. Okay. So let's go on to the next question here. Um, and this one will be a quick one. Alpita asks, if we get the monthly subscription to schoolism, do we get our assignments critiqued or viewed by the teachers? Sh quick answer is no. Um, that's for the premium course. So you can get into a premium course, which is, you know, a, a bunch more, a bunch pricier. But the, the really special thing about this is that the teacher will go over top and paint over top of your assignment, explaining and everything. So it's direct feedback specifically towards your strengths and weaknesses. And that's why it's so valuable. But the subscription, the monthly subscription, hey, I do the monthly subscription. It's great because you just pay a one-time fee and you can access all the classes now. Let's go on to the next question here. Isaiah asks, uh, which program do you use for YouTube videos? Uh, to record stuff, Camtasia usually. To stream stuff right now, I use OBS. And let's try to get to kind of like a more broad kind of question. Joel Santana. Um, I've taken Schoolism Live feedback courses, but wonder how to figure out my reoccurring problem areas. I feel it should be from someone who's seen my work process closely, like an instructor. Right, so you've been taking the the courses without the schoolism feedback that's what i think it is I, uh, isn't he saying that he took it with the feedback but he'd like someone to see the process i think i think it's a little mixed up i think he's saying okay. that he's taken the schoolism subscription courses but how, what he would need to do to get like in-depth feedback is take the premium you know courses with the feedback the critiqued sessions uh-huh Okay. And that's fantastic. You know, I took um, 
I did an undercover little uh, <laughs> class, right? Yeah, you know about this. I took Cody Gramstad's uh, painting with light and color, and it's the course that Tonko House Daisu Tsutsumi Robert Kondo designed. Um, and it was fantastic. I, I took it with the feedback. Cody gives like half an hour to like an hour worth of feedback. It's like a whole nother lesson. Highly recommend taking a class with him because I also took it under a pseudo name. Um, so he didn't know that it was me. So he was treating me just like everybody else. And I got the same thing. Half an hour to an hour of feedback is incredible. What is one of the, your favorite? You've taken a bunch of uh, classes with feedback. Off the top of yeah. your head, what, what was your... What, what was my favorite class? Today, <laughs> what is your favorite class? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I love... I took all the Nathan Fox that, that were amazing. Um, I took the Tonko House class, but it was with Dyson Robert. That was amazing, too. Uh, Sam Nielsen's first class was, like, life-changing. Fundamentals of lighting. Yes, I still use everyday stuff I learned in this class. Um, every class. Okay, I that's think. a bunch. That's a bunch. I was just looking for <laughs> one favorite. But uh, let's go on to the next question. Hassan asks, what do you think... What do you think how the global globalization changing the way of our thinking and its effect on art industry? Okay, so what do you think about globalization changing the way of thinking for everybody and its effect on art industry, on the art industry? Well, Hassan, I think it's a great thing for many reasons because number one, um, it's opening the doors for so many people that live in places that wouldn't have these doors open. You know, that's number one. It levels the playing field. Not only that, but things like schoolism, you know, online classes where all of a sudden it doesn't matter where you live. Anybody can get the info. That means anybody can become great, right? It doesn't matter that, oh, there's no animation school in your area. There's no uh, art, good art school in your area. There's no more excuses, really. There's tons of examples of people just learning strictly online and becoming awesome. So that's really great. But at the same time, everybody kind of gets, you think it gets harder to stand out now, T? Yeah, I feel that uh, before, um, it was rare that people that could really render stuff. And now there's so many good art everywhere. I feel being creative is a lot more important than it was because a lot of people can paint. Yes, yes. But do you still need to be able to paint? Is it kind of like, I feel like, is it an additional thing now? So now it isn't... It, it, it's not just only you need to paint well, but you need to have good ideas and yes. some extra special stuff about it. Right? Yeah, man. It's But it's good because it yeah. raises the standards. Well, all in all, if you think about it, before you needed to be pretty much like one of the top 5% in the industry to really crush it and really make uh not just have an okay career a pretty good career but to make an impression to make an impact you need to be at that top five percent and back then it was a different five percent than it is now now the top five percent they need to know how to paint and design and all that stuff and they need to have good ideas yeah awesome um when are you going to the philippines when are you inviting us to the Philippines? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I would love to go to the Philippines. As many of you know, uh, Kaya my lovely, super talented wife, she is, uh, she was born in Manila, uh, came to Canada when she was 12. So, um, yeah, I would love to go back. I've been there once. Um, Okay, Mike has a good question. This one is probably for you, T. What makes a successful applicant when applying to the Schoolism House? Do you have any examples for successful portfolio submissions? So what do you look for, T? 
Um, it's a really good question. And uh, I feel a lot of people, they're really nervous about their portfolio when they apply to the Schoolism House. And I feel a lot of people, it keeps them from applying and they take a long time to apply because they want to work on more stuff uh, from the portfolio for the portfolio. But um, I feel we're all at different levels in uh, our kind of journey to become the artist we want to be. And um, I, it's not just based on the portfolio and on the skills. Um, I look at the art that people submit in terms of it tells me who they are and what they do. And I can tell if people are passionate and if they draw. I don't really look at where they are at that point. I choose people that are passionate about art, that they know what they want. But it's mostly, that, it's mostly about their poor... Now, I'm just assuming, right? But I always assume that it's more about their personality than anything. Yeah, I choose people that have a passion for art that I think I can help take their art to the next level and that seem that they're going to be fun to hang out and live together for 30 days. Yeah, because, you know, the thing is, uh, I don't know about you, T, but I've always been a slow learner, I feel. And I feel like you, I don't want to speak for you, but I feel like <laughs> we have that a bit in common. Yeah, I, we totally learn the same way, I think. Yeah, like we can't just take your complex whatever explanation to do whatever and then just do it and uh, take your information and now it's mine and now I've totally absorbed it. No, I got to break it all down. Like I got to ask you a million <laughs> questions, break it down to like ones and zeros, like completely basic and then build it back up in my own kind of theory. I totally think the same way. But I think that's also why um, that's a good trait for teachers in general, yeah. right? Because you can explain stuff afterwards when you you really need to understand what you're doing, right? Yeah. And when it's done, you can easily explain it to people. Yeah. That's Definitely. exact. That's usually that, that's how I start teaching at Sheridan. I was going to like drawing all the time, and that's where we met. And I had to break down everything and think about it for hours until I understand it. And after that, I could just help friends and classmates and tell them, see, you do this because of that. That's how it works because of this. And that's how I start teaching. Mm, I see. Yeah, teaching has really helped me to actually learn a lot more, too, because, again, it's like you have to break things down even more when you're teaching a lot of times. Mm -hmm. Now, Jessica asks this question that I don't even, I really don't want to answer, but I'm going to answer. Okay. She <laughs> asks, do you like Star Wars and would you like to work on it? Now I saw the new Star Wars and I'm not going to give any spoilers, but I will say this. I, I was really built up. You know, like my standards were, my expectations were so high. And I think that was the problem. Um, my expectations were too high. You know, like when you like the first one so much or whatever, I liked the last one a lot, Force Awakens. And so I was expecting tremendous things. And I think I just had my hopes too high because uh, I did leave, you know, a little disappointed. A lot disappointed. Um, but overall, I think if everybody goes in just going, mm, it's a movie, whatever, then they'll leave going, eh, it's pretty good. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but would I like to work on it? Of course I would love to work on Star Wars. Star Wars was one of the big reasons why um, I went into movies in the first place. I was working on Star Wars toys for episode one. Uh, what was that one called? I forget. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it's the one with the little kid, little Anakin and racing around stuff. So I got to design a bunch of toys for that. And, and that's what got me super interested in working on movies. Now, um, 
This is a really good one. This is, I, I like for this to be for both of us. You could go first, T. Um, Kaylee asks, last stream you said to prepare yourself for the answer no. I feel like if I tried that, I'd mentally psych myself out in a way that I'd set myself up for failure. Any tips on how to avoid this? Hmm. Um, when I go and do something, I've usually no expectation, just like we were talking about the movies. Interesting. Um, Interesting. And I remember, like, I'm going to relate this to the movie things we were talking about before. Um, I never watch any trailers for movies. And when I go to the movies, it's like, when I was a kid and my parents take me to the movie, I don't even know where we're going. And then I end up there. I have no idea what I'm going to watch. I haven't watched any trailer for Star Wars. Right, right. I'm sure I heard a lot of people were disappointed, but uh, I'm sure I'll be blown away. But uh, when I go uh, for, I'm, we're talking about a job or an interview or something like that, I'm, I'm uh, assuming. Yeah, yeah. Like, say, yeah, you're trying to get hired or something. It's it's much different than just watching a movie and having good expectations, right? Like, how but do you I go there kind of not expecting a yes or a no. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and I, I, you know what? Like, uh, I think this is really good for us to go over because I don't fully agree with you on this one. So I'm very interested to hear like your side of things. Cause for me, it's like, if I'm not expecting, if I'm not, it's not like I'm expecting a certain outcome, but I'm preparing myself for different outcomes, right? I'm trying to cover my bases. So if something does kind of come out of nowhere and surprise me, uh, I won't get caught off, off guard and my lizard brain turns on and I just, you know, I go into fight or flight or something like that. Okay, I, I get what you're saying. I usually act like I already got it. Hmm. When I send stuff for, uh, when they ask me to te for test for children's book and stuff like that, I talk to them. There's really subtle things I write in the email that I write where I'm talking. I'm not saying like, if I get this, blah, blah, blah. I'm, I'm saying, so when I will start this, I will blah, blah, blah. So there's, in the way I, I talk to them and write to them, I assume I already got it, but it's more of a subconscious thing, assuming that I already have it. But uh, if I go for an interview or something like that, I just, I, I read this thing once, it was saying over prepare and then go with the flow. Yes. I just go there and I just, I just talk to people nice and i just see how it goes and uh right but the thing is like i like what you're saying there but the thing is those times that you get caught off guard perhaps you going you're going in there expecting that you're you're visualizing okay i already got this you know i'm good i'm confident whatever and then you go in there and you got this big smile on your face and you're talking very confidently and the person's like why would i even listen to you you know, and it catches you off guard. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah, because sometimes these things happen. And that's why I'm saying prepare yourself, like focus on, yeah, I got this, I got this, I got this, I got this. And then towards the last five minutes or whatever, towards the last bit is when I think, okay, if this person jumps out and starts yelling at me, if this person does this, <laughs> this is what I'm going to do, right? And just... This is how I'm going to bring it back to a successful uh, result. You don't do any of that? I don't do the, the, that part that you're talking about. But you think about the, the possibility of success as well. You're just saying absolutely. be prepared for every kind of possibility, including uh, rejection. If I want to give it some sort of weird ratio, I would say... 80, 75%, I'm thinking success. I'm visualizing, I'm preparing myself mentally, psyching myself up to be confident. And then the 20%, 25%, I'm going over 
uh, scenarios where things might start to go wrong and how do I bounce back? Okay, that's cool. I, when I use, when I start teaching at Sheridan, I was uh, terrified. I don't know if you remember. It was my first real big teaching thing. And I was thinking about that in a way I was, uh, I was praying in the car, but I was not praying for things to go well. I was praying for having the strength to keep going and make things go well if they go bad. Ah. Okay. Yeah. Kind of, kind of same thing. Kind of. Um, but for me, I, yeah, like I'm not just thinking about having the strength. I'm thinking about what would I actually do? Right. So, uh, two different thoughts, two different opinions. Let's go on to the next question here. Um, so the next question is, well, there's one question talking about how do you draw organic forms in a, in a, curvilinear perspective so fisheye perspective um that's okay so that's something that it feels like it needs a demo a, a, you know all <laughs> sorts of stuff i'm gonna just go on to the next one if uh if telepert perte doesn't mind uh lisa j asks i'm trying to get into art school for animation and my school of preference only takes 18 people each year. What would be the most important thing to focus on in my portfolio? I think the best thing to do is go to that school, whatever school that you're trying to get into, talk with the teachers, ask them what, you know, is, what are they looking for in your portfolio? Perhaps go there with some stuff and go, is it like this? Is this what you're talking about? Because I remember when I was applying for school for uh, Sheridan College Animation, I read their portfolio thing. I did it, but I did it wrong. You know, I didn't know what they were exactly looking for. They just said, draw a bunch of naked people in different poses. I was like, okay, I could do that. You know, but I didn't know that they were looking for Build it up with simplified, simplified structure first. You know, you're building from the inside outwards and so on and so forth. Cause I could have totally did that. First time I applied for Sheridan Bobby, I got 10% on the portfolio. Nice, nice. And that's actually, that is why, uh, T accepts people for the schoolism house mostly based on their personality and how they are like in their heads rather than their portfolio because anybody you know there's going to be some people that start off very strong and then they putter out and no more gas you know then there's other people that start off slow and keep building and building until they're a giant rocket ship you know, mm. so it's not right to judge people in the very beginning because there is no way of knowing. There is we no were way of all knowing. there, you know? Exactly. 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 And it's it, like judging a baby, you know? It's like you draw like a baby, you know? <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> it's like judging <laughs> a baby, but I well, get I get what you're saying. We all been like at the beginning before we could even draw. You know, any successful artist had to start from nothing. Absolutely. So you can't really judge on where people are at, but you can help them get further and take their stuff to the next level. Yeah, there's no way of knowing. No matter what your background is, no matter what your situation is, there is no way of knowing whether you're going to succeed or you're going to fail. You know, um, interesting little story to think about, right? There's this father, very abusive. He's a drunk. He beats his kids, two little sons. And when these two sons, they grow up, one becomes a belligerent drunk, very violent towards his kids, bad temper, just horrible. And the other brother turns into the the most outstanding citizen, the best father, always 
taking time to listen to his kids and be with them and, and just such a role model. And when they were asked, each of them, how did you end up this way? They both said, with a father like that, how could I not? <laughs> right? That's a pretty cool story, I think, because it's just awesome. like, it doesn't matter your situation. It just matters you, the choices that you make, you know, mm -hmm. with your situation that will determine your, your outcome. Anyways, why don't we go on to another question here. Ariel asks, uh, I'm a children's book illustrator who just bought a Schoolism subscription. Right on. I'm working my way through Alex Wu's gesture drawing class. What other courses would you suggest for my profession? I, a really great one, just off the bat, I would say Wouter Tulp's uh, character, expressive characters class. You know, he has illustrated over a hundred children's book, a uh, hundred children's books. Um, so he's fantastic. And another one would probably be a painting class and also perhaps a storyboarding class because you're telling stories. Is uh, Chris's class still there? Yeah. Yeah. Chris's class is still there. Chris Pern teaches uh, storyboarding on schoolism. He has a class on there. Um, why don't we go on to the next question here? So where crow? How did you keep yourself going when you're running against a wall with your art? When you felt your creativity and your craft was at its lowest? Wow. What do you I think? I feel for creativity for me is to get outside of the house <laughs> and do anything. But what are you thinking about when you're outside doing anything? Are you thinking, what's a good idea? What's a good idea? What's a good idea? I just observe people and things happening. And I see so much cool ideas. Mm. Okay. But you live in the woods. You know, you live on the side of a lake. You go outside, there are no people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I mean, there's like place I can go when there's people oh, like okay. there's farms and stuff like that or just outside I yeah. see a bunch of cool stuff the other day it was like tiny tiny little frogs mm. and like this is always I discover thing in my backyard like all the time and you know it works as well I think if you're in the city that if you're totally in the country it is true there is like there is inspiration wherever you go it doesn't really matter you know, like when I think about those frogs in our little frog pond in the schoolism house, to me, that's like Lord of the Rings happening there where it's like these <laughs> big creatures and these small creatures and it's war and they're like eating each other and stuff. It's crazy. And I, you know, do stuff with your friends, do, do stuff like uh, me. My niece is four years old and my nephew is one and a half and they have so much imagination. I just, if I run out of ideas, I just hang out with them. Or you might have, have some friends like Flavio that you know, Bobby, that did the workshop. Every time I hang out with Flavio, some really crazy thing happen. Right. But this is talking about like, well, I, I'm not sure how uh where where crow is and where this person lives or anything but uh if you got no friends around you if you got nobody around you that understands what you're doing hey, i'll give you a suggestion look up thierry lafontaine on pinterest and uh, you can follow him because the other thing that we do is we make little pinterest boards and we post up and we put like cool images and stuff like that. And you did a really great job of like separating them into different categories and such. So if you ever do have uh, kind of like a, a creative block, what I do recently is I go to your boards, T, and I just check out your different boards that you have and, and uh, start painting some or get inspired by some to create my own thing. That's happened multiple times in the last month. 
Thank you, Bobby. I love I love researching things, and the internet is such a great source of inspiration. You know, you can spend hours on there. Yeah. Without even wanting. And the other thing is, I should have thought about this in the first place. Um, if you learn something, it doesn't have to be from schoolism. I know we're talking about schoolism a bunch, but it's really just because we believe in schoolism. I believe in school. Anyways, if you learn anything, right? Yes. You learn something. Now you have more possibilities. Now you're able to try something, do something that you couldn't do before. You didn't understand how to do it before. You know, so when you just take a class, for example, um, you're learning something and the class is telling you what to paint and draw. So mm -hmm. you're being confined a bit, which makes it easier to come up with an idea a lot of times. When it's completely blue sky, you can do whatever you want. That's when it becomes very difficult. You know, so I always have a class that I'm on. So I'll take that class and just do that thing um, until it sparks up an idea or whatever. Or I do it for a while. I leave it, go back to the drawing board, and I have a bunch of ideas. And a thing that I do, you know, the person that was asking what class to recommend for a children's book? Yeah. Often when I do a class on schoolism, I kind of take it in a certain direction. Uh, a few uh, months back, I wanted to do more children's book, and then I did Daniel Arriaga's class and uh, Steven Silver's class. And I was thinking, I want to do their class and the assignment geared toward children's book. Mm -hmm. And that could be the same for any class that you take. You can be like, you know, landscape painting with Nathan Fox, maybe more with for children's book. You know what I mean? Oh, absolutely. There's a new class today that just opened today with the the amazing, the masterful Carcamo. Uh, oh. He teaches watercolor, and we've both taken that class. It's phenomenal. He does children's books. Imagine being able to do breathtaking watercolor children's book illustrations uh have you seen his portfolio when you came to the studio oh i bought i bought two pieces from him i wouldn't let him leave without you know <laughs> giving me a couple pieces so i yeah i have a couple of his uh children's book illustrations they're Amazing. phenomenal yeah just phenomenal um let's go on to the next question so firk firk loveret asks uh <laughs> i probably butchered that name i apologize how much time do you spend studying compared to art pieces and projects i spend a good you know one hopefully two hours of studying and just you know my own time and then the rest of the time is like projects and stuff what about you t uh, it varies. Sometimes I got more projects, sometimes less. Uh, when I got more projects, uh, I work, it's maybe 80, 20. But if, if I have less project, I do as much, um, studying and trying new things and experimenting as I can. That's very interesting. You know, because what I do is, uh, I will only take a maximum of whatever amount of projects because that time where I do my own personal art, my own learning, it's sacred. I will not let anything get into that part of my schedule. So it's always like an hour, two hours. Um, there is the occasional emergency and things like that. So, but for the most part, it's, it's quite strict. And I try to, when I have less project, I try to work on personal projects mm -hmm. and to do kind of try to do stuff that I cannot do and try to get to that level. Cause I feel, um, usually I take projects that terrifies me. <laughs> And I think I will need to get my art to the next level to do that. Mm -hmm. And I tried to do that for some personal projects that I work on as well. 
you know, actually this painting, you know, somebody was asking how, uh, you know, how come the thumbnail for this painting was done and now you're painting it? Well, I, you know, this is pre-recorded. YouTube magic, everybody. Um, <laughs> you know, and that's because if I have to read a question, then I have to stop painting. And I just felt it'd be nicer if you just watched me paint something where I'm just thinking about the painting. Because a lot of times as well, when you're talking and you're thinking about all this other stuff, then you don't really give it your all in your painting, right? So that's mm -hmm. why you're actually seeing this painting being done. But the cool thing is, is that you get to see the whole entire process of this painting from the initial idea, which changed quite a bit uh, until the end. And you know, still there's the tropical leaves, the tropical plants in the background, but now I put snow on them, which doesn't make sense either. So later I'm going to change them to, uh, I think like pine trees. Uh, that was the idea behind it. But, um, this is a personal project. You know, I've been painting, if you follow me on Instagram, where you can see the link, uh, on the screen there, You'll see that I have a bunch, I have like a series of unusual unicorns. And that was very much, that's just a personal uh, project for me. It's not for anything, it's just for kicks. You know why? It's because um, unicorns are supposed to be unique. They're supposed to be special. And I've just felt like nowadays they're not as special anymore. You know what I mean to you? Like it's almost mm -hmm. cheesy, like a cheesy theme, you know, fairy riding unicorn battling dragon or something like that. I just want to bring the unique back. <laughs> That's awesome. It's like really great. How did you get the idea because of that? Yeah. Did it happen at a specific time where you were like, you know what? Um, I wonder, I, I believe it was just somebody saying, uh, like using the term unicorn as like, oh, that's, that's the special one. Oh, that's the unicorn. Okay. Right. And I was like thinking, yeah, but unicorns aren't even that special anymore. You know, when you draw them anyways. So yeah, bring it back, bring back the unique Rick in unicorn. You're uh, bringing back the unicorn in unicorn. There you go. <laughs> uh, let's go on to the next question. Bilu, did any of you have a non-art related job? I'm about to get one, but really anxious about feeling like I'm losing time, but I really need the money. Love from Argentina. Hey, right back at you, Argentina. Um, did I ever have a non, we both have had non art related jobs. I've had some horrible jobs, you know, working in a rec center, cleaning, <laughs> um, public swimming pools and the filters in public swimming pools. I won't get into ah. details. I won't <laughs> get into details, but, uh, sometimes, yeah, sometimes you lose <laughs> a band aid or whatever in a swimming pool. Well, I find them, <laughs> you know, uh, mopping a hockey stadium by myself. That was a horrible job. I like, you know, if you had to pick a non art related art job, I like the ones where you can actually still draw a bit, you know, like a security job where you're watching the monitors, you're watching the monitors, you're drawing a little bit and you take a stroll every, you know, half an hour, 45 minutes, and then you come back and you start drawing again. You do sketch of the people stealing stuff from the little TVs. <laughs> sure, I guess. It might be helpful uh, catching the people later. Um, gas station, you know, that's a pretty nice one too because if it's like, um, you know, by yourself or whatever, you can pass the time doing sketching. Fed, Federico asks, uh, it's a good idea to have two portfolios and two nicknames, two pseudonames, if you have very different kinds of art, uh, for example, concept art and then children's book illustrations. 
Yeah, if the concept art is like for Walking Dead, and then children's book illustrations are for <laughs> like five year olds, yeah, I would say you would probably. Be... It depends on how different they are, right, T? Yeah, I'm. Uh... I was thinking about that lately, and we talked a little bit about it before. Yeah, a long time ago, I w I was thinking of having this other pseudo name. Do you remember what it was? Ah, uh, it was a animal name or blue a color. Is it something like that? It'd be the green lizard. <laughs> <laughs> I just put my name as the green lizard everywhere and do whatever the hell I want. And the idea was. You know, can I get traction if I had to start all over with a completely new name? Uh, but would you have a website for a person maybe with two different sections, a concept art and a children's book, or straight up two names? I would have two names. I would have yeah. two names, two, two websites even. Yeah, if it's that different. Okay, if it's very similar. Like I do live action films. And, you know, children's stuff, absolutely. Um, you know, but it's, even though perhaps Men in Black might be kind of scary for little kids, um, or there's like an alien movie that I did that was kind of a, a little gory but funny, hasn't come out yet. Um, you know, I work on a, a children's book or a children's film for literally like you know six seven eight year old kids it wasn't that bad you know it's not that different but if you're going from hentai you know uh <laughs> totally rated x stuff and then doing like children's book stuff yeah you should have completely different names it just depends on how different the two your two passions are mm -hmm. <laughs> porn and children book <laughs> yeah i wouldn't recommend it i'm only saying that that example because i was actually thinking about a portfolio that somebody asked me to review and it was totally that it was it was mind-boggling how this person wouldn't kind of separate the two um <laughs> anyways brahma asks focus on one discipline or just do what you love when you want it I work as a motion designer and I would like to change my career when I feel like my skins are my skills are up to the challenge. Focus on one discipline. Yeah, uh, that's that's exactly what I would say. Focus on one discipline at a time. Um that's the best way to get rock solid super sharp skills. It's through all the boring stuff. Right? Um Storm Engineer asks, I struggle to paint loose. I always end up over rendering because it feels off or I'm just trying to fix it uh, until it's very tightly rendered or loses life. What do you suggest, T? 30 minute studies. <laughs> or paint small, you know what I mean? When I, you know, I always use probably a smaller second window. Mm-hmm. I know you talk about that in your class, but... Um, yeah, I have a smaller window right now on right the now? screen. Okay. So this window helps you see how it looks from far away. And often when I do really short studies, like 30-minute studies, sometimes I don't use a small window because my main window is as small as the small window. So I paint really, really small, and it helps you keep it loose. And if you know there's a time limit on it, then that's going to be it. Then you don't have time to super render stuff. Mm. Great. Well, yeah, be time conscious and everything as well. Absolutely. Uh, here's a familiar one from Noah, our friend in Israel. She's the one that is going to be hosting the, the um, Tel Aviv workshop that I'm going to be attending with Sam Nielsen. So that's going to be awesome. Noah asks, I find myself lately getting stuck between the stuff I need to do and the stuff I really want to do. Did you ever encounter it? And if so, how do you deal, decide, or focus and move on? That 
is a common thing that will happen to anybody that um, that any, that is kind of like a proactive person, I think. You know, a lot of times, especially as we start to tumble our way through life, things kind of stick on us like little burrs, you know, responsibilities and things that you might start and now need to continue. You know, when we were talking earlier about um, painting our own stuff, time for studying and all that stuff, I think that is kind of like the key to answering this question is that you can't let anybody touch that sacred time, not even you. You can't change that time where you are supposed to work on the things that you really want to do. Schedule it in. Right now, Noah, look at your calendar. Look at if this week is too tough, you know, because Christmas and all, or the holidays or whatever anybody is celebrating out there. If you guys are you know, in the same situation, look a week from now. Or if you're super busy, two weeks from now, pick a time right now on whatever day, block it in. These hours is going to be for doing your own stuff. And as long as you block it in ahead of time, you will be able to manage. If anybody, if right now, say one of your family members, your parents, or whatever, needed you right now. It's an emergency. You need to deal with this. And you need to perhaps take care of them, you know, uh, two hours a day. You would do it. It would be tough, and you would do it. And you'd accomplish it, right? It's about making those rock-solid decisions that are unmovable. I... I think Marcelo Vignali was saying that as an interview. That's, and he absolutely influenced me with that interview. He does talk about that. He um, was saying you have to be unreasonable. Yes. So I want to ask you a tough question, T. Do you have a time that is unmovable, that is for your personal stuff right now? I don't, Bobby, but uh, after this, a chat we're having right now, I will do that. Right on. Awesome. Uh, let's go on to the next question. So this is um, Samuel asks, I'm currently trying to work on color and light. Any tips on doing studies more effectively? T? To work on color and light? I feel um, doing your studies. Life, yeah. studies yeah doing studies but, more effectively well you know, half an hour time <laughs> limit that's what you'd say <laughs> for the color studies you know i keep it under an hour but i feel um i love to do it from real life but that can be really hard um you, i don't know if you remember bobby but before you were saying you gotta study from life from pictures from um other people's art yeah and from imagination yeah i still believe in that but i feel the most beautiful color you ever see is from real life and when i take a picture i'm usually always super pissed off i'm looking at something and i take a picture and i feel but at least if you see it and you took the picture, you kind of remember a little bit. But I feel the most beautiful color you're ever going to get to study from is from real life. And um, I don't know if uh, that person only does stuff digitally. But uh, one thing that helps to do stuff with real life is to paint traditionally. Mm. And it influences a lot the way you paint uh, digitally. Um, me, when I work on color, my, one of some of my favorite exercise of color that I do is, uh, I think it's at the beginning of every class from Nathan, he makes you study, do studies from master and from real life. And it's, uh, Nathan's little painting. If you look at Nathan Fox, real little paintings on, uh, his, uh, uh blog, uh, Landsketch. They're all 20 minutes to an hour, and he does two a day every day, no matter what. And um, they're very small. They're like two inch by three inches. 
So he, he does two a day. And um, I feel keeping it short like this, you can do many, many, many instead of spending a lot of time on one. Fantastic. Thank you so much, T, for your awesome advice. And thank you to everybody for tuning in. And uh, for those of you that are Schoolism members, part of the Schoolism community and everything, you're subscribed. You are on the Facebook group. Got a special surprise for you. Tomorrow, we're going to have the director, Jorge Gutierrez. Gutierrez on the stream live for just the Schoolism feedback group people where you can ask them questions and I'll be asking questions and everything. And uh, so definitely join us tomorrow for that. And if you're interested in the Schoolism House, go to schoolism.com and apply. Right now we are looking, we are... Um, Taking uh, application for February 25 to March 26. Yes. If you want to come and hang out with me for 30 days, of intense learning and painting and fun and we get a guest artist every workshop to come hang out with us for a few days and it's uh, painting drawing learning from the time you get up to the time you go to sleep and when we get a guest artist it's not only class you get from them but we have dinner together we play games so you get to know them on a personal level it is truly a uh, unique unique you remember for the rest of your life kind of experience. So, you know, if you, if you're able, I would say go for it. It's a really great thing. Uh, I go there about three times a year, something like that as well. Um, so it's super fun. And of course, there's a bunch of little announcements. So the schoolism winter sale get on that get a year subscription because right now it's a hundred dollars off for an annual subscription and of course hope to see you guys at the schools and workshops as well so that's it for us uh t you want to add anything else no i just want to thank you bobby it was great chatting with you live excellent same here. Thank you so much, T. Can't wait till our paths cross again. And uh, that's it, everybody. So take care and see a bunch of you tomorrow. Now, if you live in an environment where it's way too hard to buckle down to get into your art and there's just way too many distractions and you really, really want to get intense about learning and improving, I highly recommend applying for the Schoolism House. It's a house that we have just outside of Montreal, Canada in St. Julien. It's a big house with a lake in the back and only four artists are accepted at one time to live in this house for a 30-day intense workshop where you would actually be living with your mentor Thierry LaFontaine so not only are you eating drinking sleeping breathing art every day all day 30 days straight but you're also living with your mentor to see him struggle through his projects to see him stay up at night to see him when he wakes up and things like that the perfect environment to get supercharged not only that but this house attracts the hungriest of the hungriest artists out there. So you would be living with three other artists from around the world to push you towards your dreams, to push each other in this awesome environment where there is nothing to think about except for art. And towards the end of your stay, we fly in a guest artist. Sometimes it's me, sometimes it's somebody else. You know, and there's been Nathan Fowkes there, there's been Steven Silver there, Sam Nielsen, John Hardesty, tons of amazing artists, and they would stay there with you for a few days, living with you as well. So not just teaching you art, but breaking bread with you and just living with you so that you can get the ultimate, ultimate experience with the perfect artistic environment around you. You can sign up right here. See if you get in, see what happens, because it's an amazing experience. All right, everybody, thank you for watching, and I'll catch you guys next time.
Subscribe to this channel and then press the notification button so you won't miss out on new videos, tutorials, interviews, and other news slash advice for artists. If you like this channel, share it with the artists in your life. Thanks for watching.